in a way you're not really trying to bring your intimate self, your uh, everything you are to the public and to uh, do what um, what you see a lot of these days on Facebook as people really showing who they are and pouring all the you know their most inner thoughts for everybody to to be exposed there and and everybody's supposed to accept that. Welcome to the Acton Vault Podcast, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. In October 2018, Brazilian professor Lucas Ferrer delivered the 18th annual Callahan Lecture here at the Acton Institute. Ferrer was a 2018 recipient of the Novak Award, a $15,000 grant that rewards those early in their academic career who can demonstrate the relationship between religion, economic freedom, and the free and virtuous society. Recipients of the Novak Award make a formal presentation at an annual public forum known as the Callahan Lecture. Ferrer's lecture was part of the international two-day conference, Crisis in the Public Square, a response from the Kuyperian tradition. You can find additional resources in the show notes of this episode, as well as previous episodes on our website at acton.org slash podcast. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Vault is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. My name is Father Robert Sirico, and I'm the president and co-founder of the Acton Institute. And I would like to welcome everyone again, including those joining us virtually for this conference. Uh, we will now move to the final session of today's events, the presentation of the Acton Institute's Novak Award, to hear our annual Callahan Lecture, which will be delivered by the awards recipient. Created in 2000, thanks to the generosity of Mr. Joseph Callahan and named after the theologian, the late Michael Novak, the Novak Award represents uh, rewards outstanding research into the relationship between theology, economic freedom, and the free and virtuous society by recognizing those early career scholars who demonstrate intellectual merit in advancing the understanding of theology's connections to the themes of freedom, especially economic liberty. This Award comes with a $15,000 prize. In past years, it has been awarded to scholars from Argentina, Australia, France, Singapore, the United States, Finland, Italy, Germany, Lithuania, Poland, just to name a few. This year's Novak Award, we are delighted to say has been awarded to Professor Lucas Ferrer. His full biography is in your folder or online. Professor Ferrer is an assistant professor at the McKinsey Presbyterian University in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and a fellowship of the university's new Center for Economic Freedom. His research and writing focuses on political and economic issues, drawing on Christian thinking in the Reformed tradition. Without further ado, I would like to invite to the platform Professor Ferrer, who will deliver the 2018 Callahan Lecture. Shortly before the breakdown of European Christendom in the Thirty Years' War, Johannes Althusius, a Christian reform politician, made a strong statement about the need to engage with public life and the impossibility of living in self-absorbed isolation from society at large. Quote, the end of political symbiotic man is holy, just, comfortable, and happy symbiosis, a life lacking nothing, either necessary or useful. Truly, in living this life, no man is self-sufficient or adequately endowed by nature. 
Therefore, as long as he remains isolated and does not mingle in the society of man, he cannot live at all comfortably and well, even if he merely wants to live. And so he begins to think by what means such symbiosis can be instituted, cultivated, and conserved. End quote. Centuries later, Alexis de Tocqueville noticed that the rise of egalitarian democracy had, at least to some extent, enabled self-absorbed individuals to maintain a reasonable standard of living with no need to engage with political affairs. In his Democracy in America, Tocqueville denounced the extreme kind of individualism which, quote, disposes each member of the community to sever himself from the mass of his fellows and to draw apart with his family and his friends, despising the value of public life. The interest of man is confined to those in close propinquity to himself, end quote. For Althusius, public life was a matter of survival. For Tocqueville, it had a different value. The danger faced by society of self-absorbed individuals was that it would facilitate the rise of despotism. For the latter, quote, sees in the separation among men the surest guarantee of its continuance, and it usually makes every effort to keep them separate. Both thinkers agreed that a collapse of public life could pose a threat to free and virtuous societies. Today, many observers worry about the situation of our political environment. Following this logic, then, we do well to worry about the contemporary crisis in the public square. In what follows, I provide an overview of the main challenges that we face in the public square. They are discussed both on the surface and on a deeper level, where there is some disagreement about the root causes of the current crisis. My other task here is to articulate a Christian interpretation of the problem, drawing on the reformational tradition made famous by Abram Kuyper and creatively expanded by many of his followers. In my intellectual journey, this tradition of thought has enabled me to engage in important conversations on politics, society, and economics. It has provided me with conceptual tools that allow me to take part in those conversations as a believer in Jesus Christ who hopes to be able to contribute to a better understanding of politics, society, and economics. A believer, like several others, who hopes to attain a faithful response to the issues we face within those realms. What sort of crisis are we facing in our political environment? I'd like to make a tentative list of problems on the surface prior to a discussion of deeper issues about which there is more disagreement in the relevant literature. First, there has been a loss of substance in our conversations. Political issues are discussed in magazines, social media, and on TV with an unhealthy focus on gossip, scandal, and sensationalism. This is often done at the expense of accuracy or with little concern for the truth of what is being said. The emphasis is normally on attacking the opponent, despite, despite the well-known fact that personal attacks are not a very effective form of political persuasion, as research on media effects in elections show. People turn to memes, catchy phrases, and name-calling substituting these for genuine discussion of ideas, policy projects, or a more careful debate on values and priorities. There is, in short, a crisis of dialogue. This relates to a second surface level challenge, namely the excessive personalization of public life. This affects, on the one hand, how we face politicians, we now tend to transpose our fascination for celebrity artists to the political realm. We seem too obsessed with the public figure as a private person, relegating the political programs defended by that person to the second plan. On the other hand, this personalization of politics also has an impact 
on how we behave in the public square and what we expect from it. Because of the self-absorption denounced by Tocqueville, we end up reducing our engagement with public issues to a matter of personal feeling. What we call identity politics is perhaps an instance of the excessive personalization and emotionalism in the public square on the side of the citizenry in general, to the point that so-called safe spaces must be provided to public universities. A direct result of this hyper-personalization of politics in civility is a third surface level challenge that we face in the public square. In his book, The Fall of Public Man, philosopher Richard Sennett compares civility to a mask for public life. This mask allows us to interact with strangers as strangers in the construction of a bridge over the social gap while maintaining the gap. If, however, we lose any sense that there is or should be a healthy and workable distance between people in public life, then we should expect them to be very hostile to those who are not like them or to those who are not part of the inner circle. A group feels under threat if the rest of society is not compelled to embrace this group's life and worldview. The more intimate we become as public personae, the less sociable we are likely to be through civility. It is not a surprise that much of our engagement with the public square reflects an obsession for defining who is in and who is out. Such decline in civility is an outcome of the fact that with the stress on personalizing politics too much, the stakes are much higher. This third surface level problem related to incivility and classification by exclusion is made obvious whenever someone feels offended and claims that you are against the poor, etc. in general, because you would like to see a balanced federal budget, for example. So far, I have discussed the three surface level problems of poor dialogue, hyper-personalization, and incivility. There are, however, deeper political and cultural issues to which I turn now. I'd like to consider how others have defined the current crisis in the public square in their reflection on wider challenges posed by life in modern society. Some have framed this issue as a crisis of liberal democracy and the collapse of representation as a political model. Let me call this the political view. Others have interpreted the problem as a function of the rise of a peculiar kind of individualism in our culture. I, I name this the cultural view. The first view, the political view, is that the current crisis in the public square derives primarily from the inability of liberal democracy to offer proper representation to the average person in the street. The contribution of anthropologist Manuel Castells to this debate illustrates the political view. In his recent book, Ruptura, Castells identifies quite a few problematic trends in democratic participation. He describes what he calls the, quote, crisis of the old political order in a list of negative phenomena. The quote again, the subversion of democratic institutions by narcissistic chiefs who own the strings of power leveraged by people's abhorrence of institutional rottenness and social injustice, manipulation of frustrated hopes by serpent enchanters through the media, the apparent and transitory renewal of political representation by co-opting projects for change, the pure and simple return of the unrestrained brutality of the state around the world, and finally, the entrenchment of political cynicism as a form of representation." End quote. All these problems are outcomes, according to him, of a crisis of liberal democracy as such, or the, quote, the gradual collapse of a political module of model of representation and governance and a breach of relationship between rulers and the ruled. 
Representative democracy in this view is as good as the population's belief that their rulers mirror the way they see and decide things. The problem is that contemporary politics has shaken this belief. People feel very poorly represented by their rulers. Why is that so? According to Castells, this crisis of liberal democracy is a consequence of globalization, both because it limits the power of the state to respond to the demands of its own citizens, and because it widens the gap between the ruling elites and the rest of the people. Globalization restricts the capacity of government reaction to the heavier problems experienced by the average person because many of those issues are global in scope. The state tackles them now only indirectly by making use of international organizations and their unelected technicians. This move aggravates the perception of a democratic deficit. People feel disenfranchised. In addition to this, globalization encourages and maintains cosmopolitan networks of power, wealth, and influence for the ruling class. There is a general perception that the ruling class is cartelizing political power, creating barriers to entry into the political process. Quote, cosmopolitans and locals live increasingly in different dimensions of social practice, and as a result, the representation of humans in the democratic political construction based on the community defined by the nation state undergoes a profound crisis of legitimacy. The majority, on the one hand, is alienated from relevant decision-making processes. On the other, it retreats to the local level. According to Castells, there are three common responses to this collapse of political representation. First, bottom-up grassroots movements seek to, quote, articulate a new relationship between parliamentary representation and social representation. Now, a few years ago, we saw in the US two examples of this first response, the 99% or Occupy Wall Street protests and the Tea Party movement. Second, charismatic politicians present themselves as revolutionary outsiders who will fight the system and restore the connection between political decisions and the preferences of the population in general. We see that uh, in Donald J. Trump's portrait of himself as a non-politician and his promise to drain the swamp, and that appeals to the idea behind the second response. The third reaction is an authoritarian turn that has explicitly raised doubts about the liberal model, per se, particularly in Eastern Europe and Latin America, where we see a growing support for illiberal democracy. That is the political view. In addition to this political view, there is also a second approach to the deeper crisis in the public square, which focuses on the radical individualistic traits of our contemporary culture. Besides Richard Sennett, philosopher Charles Taylor has also contributed to this discussion by following Tocqueville's idea that too much self-absorption poses a potential threat to public life. In The Ethics of Authenticity, Taylor discusses a type of individualism which is directed towards self-fulfillment. This modern view states that each person is entitled to find out for themselves the best way to live based on what they think matters the most or what they value as individuals. Quote, people are called upon to be true to themselves and to seek their own self-fulfillment this has been denounced as a dark side of individualism that has gained strength in our contemporary culture because of the loss of a sense of a higher purpose. Too much self-absorption, quote, flattens and narrows our lives, makes them poorer in meaning and less concerned with others or society. Taylor warns us of the danger of fragmentation resulting from this loss of a broader vision. We become, quote, increasingly less capable of forming a common purpose and carrying it out. And much of what we do in the public square involves partial groupings and specific projects or causes, but not the entire community. 
This explains the emphasis on issue-oriented campaigning and spe uh, specific judicial battles in the U.S. Supreme Court. On general matters, this engagement is the normal attitude. Taylor goes as far as to declare that in this mindset, quote, a common project comes to seem utopian and naive. Now, Senate refers to a similar outcome of self-absorbed individualism in his essay on the fall of public man. Like Taylor, Senate alludes the quest for authenticity as a modern problem. Quote, each person's self has become his principal burden. To know oneself has become an end instead of a means through which one knows the world. The public square has meaning only as a means to self-knowledge. This explains political disengagement on the one hand, and on the other, the strongly emotional character of contemporary political practice and discourse. Quote, the public problem of contemporary society, says Senate, is twofold. Behavior and issues which are impersonal do not arouse much passion. The behavior and the issues begin to arouse passion when people treat them falsely as though they were matters of personality. The phenomena of identity politics and of the secular charisma of political leaders are two instances where we can find political passion precisely because what is public becomes personal. Common to both the political and the cultural approach to this deeper crisis in the public square is the view that capitalism is somewhat at fault. Castells is under the impression, for example, that the powerlessness of the state in handling social problems caused by the latest economic crisis, while at the same time bailing out big banks and corporations, is an indication that capitalism alienates the common people from public life. Large media conglomerates feed despair to the population, conveying the message that radical change is impossible. And globalization as such impels the average person to withdraw from public cosmopolitan life and to find refuge in belonging to a local group. Senate links, among other factors, the rise of industrial capitalism to the fall of public man. At first, the resulting transition to urban life was softened by a traditional framework for engagement with public affairs. Later on, the new bourgeois mindset took over the public square and reduced it to a realm of individual expression. Quote, personality became a social category and so intruded into the public realm. Senate discusses the poverty of contemporary public life within this framework, the popular feeling of resentment against the ruling class, the anti-urban and anti-cosmopolitan inclinations of the populace, and its tribalistic tendencies, together with an emphasis on the secular charisma of our political leaders, are all described in this light. Castells articulates his critique of capitalism by focusing on contemporary globalization, whereas Senate relies on a long-run historical argument. Taylor, in turn, combines both sides when he denounces the pervasiveness of instrumental reason which for him is an effect of the expansion of the market's role in modern life. If applied outside the scope of economic relations, instrumental reason can lead to distortion, such as, for example, the use of the public square to pursue individualistic goals, public means to a self-centered end. However, Taylor is less critical of capitalism than Senate in the sense that he would like to maintain a role for the market if it's kept within clear limits set by the state and by intermediary associations. It is here that Taylor interacts with Tocqueville's concern with the potential loss of freedom entailed by disengagement from public life. So to sum up thus far, in this discussion, there seems to be a negative emphasis on individualism under liberal democracy and on globalization and the market economy. These elements are perceived to be connected to the deeper political and cultural crisis in the public square. There are also the surface level problems of the poverty of dialogue, over the top personalization and incivility in political life.
From now on, I'd like to respond to those issues by drawing on a Christian reformational foundation. At the root, the current challenges in public life are essentially spiritual and only secondarily of a political and cultural nature. They require a comprehensive view of the human person and social life, or in Kuiper's words, an architectonic critique, because, quote, they cannot be explained from incidental causes, but from a fault line in the very foundation of a social order. So first, the problem is not primarily political or cultural. While there are indeed many shortcomings in liberal democracy and individualism, there are also several advantages. Kuiper's critique of the anti-religion bias of French revolutionary liberalism may be extended to liberal democracy insofar as in its contemporary form, it asks us to leave our Christian worldview out of the public square. As Miroslav Wolf points out, quote, for religious people, it is an integral part of their religious commitment to base their convictions about public issues upon religious reasons, end quote. It is not a surprise then that Castell, Taylor, and Senate complain about the lack of a sense of higher purpose in contemporary liberal democracy. On the other hand, as Michael Novak reminds us, pluralistic liberal democracy allows for a sort of, quote, transcendence, which is approached by free consciences from a virtually infinite number of directions. Even though Taylor disagrees with the relativistic kind of individualism behind today's emphasis on being true to oneself, the principle of authenticity is, quote, a powerful moral ideal in that it instructs us about the good life and its standards. By implication, there must be some transcendent side to it, something that goes beyond the individual. Now, this is clearly shown in Novak's argument that within a liberal democracy, such values as free speech or tolerance and restraint let people pursue individual authenticity while at the same time requiring them to acknowledge by respecting those values that, quote, the common good transcends their own vision of the good, however passionately held. Therefore, the problem on this level is not so much that contemporary life stresses the individual pursuit of happiness under a pluralistic political system. I rely on Kuiper and others in the reformational tradition to say that the underlying political and cultural challenge at hand is actually spiritual. We have come to expect too much of the political process and of our politicians. I am reminded here of the psalmist's warning against putting our trust in them. Kuiper and later Hermann Doivrid theorized about several different spheres in society, each of them created by God to develop a certain side of life. Each sphere is deemed sovereign within its own domain, which means no sphere is absolute or subsumes the others. The public square broadly understood cuts across several spheres such as civil government, organized charity, the media, the university, and so on. It seems, however, that unfortunately, our thought and action narrow the diversity of purposes that the public square can serve by making them fit the sphere of policy and civil government. Concerns for identity issues, offensive speech, school curricula, and so on are reframed as matters of public justice and objects of government control, coercion, and judicial decisions. When something falls under the category of public justice, the government will use the power of the sword to handle it. In many of the issue areas, this will raise the stakes, leading to heated emotional and deeply personal debates and to a strong sense of urgency and of potential despair if we do not have it our way. This need not be so, but we must learn not to commit everything in the public square to the hands of civil government. Second, while globalization and the market economy can have a negative impact in the way politics is organized, we should avoid portraying the market economy and globalization as necessary enemies of our sense of community in the public square. The point about the market economy is more straightforward. 
It may be granted that modern industrial capitalism, with its intensification of the division of labor, has altered the way we understand and value community. We are no longer living in traditional undifferentiated societies, a point that Kuiper bitterly highlighted in his critical assessment of the social question. However, later reformational thinkers have come to see the fact of social differentiation as a good historical unfolding of God's creation in response to the cultural mandate. A market economy is not inherently antisocial. To the contrary, the existence of a well-differentiated economic sphere in modern life has moved us ahead in our historical progress. Michael Novak discusses the business corporation to illustrate how the market economy encourages us to build community. Quote, the system of democratic capitalism brought into prominence a novel social instrument, the voluntary association committed to business enterprise, the corporation. The assumption behind this invention is social, not individualistic. It holds that economic activity is fundamentally corporate, exceeding the capacity of any one individual alone. Besides, says Novak, most work nowadays is work for others. Therefore, quote, the business firm is primarily a community of persons who in various ways are trying to satisfy their basic needs and to form such businesses at the service of the whole society, end quote. Taken this way, the market economy is a major asset that enriches our public square. Now, when may capitalism become a threat? When the economic sphere oversteps its boundaries and hampers the mission of the other spheres. This often happens in market economies that lack an appropriate level of economic freedom to operate and where there is much incentive to make use of economic power to purchase favorable, favorable political outcomes, crony capitalism facilitates corruption, which in turn is a major source of popular disgust at the public square. A market economy takes us farther from the medieval village model of community, granted, but it builds up modern communities of work and service. Nothing intrinsic to contemporary economic life undermines the public square unless the government allows it to get away with crime and corruption. As for globalization, we may agree that some of its aspects have encouraged a sense of alienation from the public square, particularly where decision making by the power elites is far removed from the daily reality of the average person in the street. However, and paradoxically, this happens because of too much centralization and not decentralization. Too much power is concentrated domestically on the federal level and internationally in supranational bureaucracy. Both sides of centralization within countries and between countries denote ways in which globalization can be misused as a process. Mass immigration is a good example of an unintended consequence of the combination of domestic centralization with centralization on a global scale. There is a rising concern in Western developed countries that mass immigration poses a major challenge to their way of life. Populists on the left and on the right denounce globalization as the sole cause behind it. A neglected point here is that certain countries attract more immigration precisely because they have a very centralized welfare state and a system of benefits that applies beyond emergency situations. There is then a problem with how the state has at the same time become more centralized at home and embraced supranational agreements and regulations. Proper governance on both levels cannot be achieved by eliminating lower levels of government. The positive side of globalization, though, seems underemphasized in the discussion. As James Skillen puts it, quote, we might better think of the world as an arena where new valleys and peaks are emerging in a culturally diverse and institutionally differentiating world that is also simultaneously becoming more integrated. To make use of a reformational notion, 
globalization as a phenomenon has a certain creational structure, but it may be employed in different directions. A commitment to societal coherence and diversification at home and abroad entails a redirection of domestic and international governance towards a less alienating position. This alternative way of framing of globalization and the political process in general would restrict issues of public justice to their own sovereign sphere, allowing for the other spheres to flourish without subsuming them to politics. Within the sphere of public justice, a suitable supplement to this change would be the decentralization and devolution of power to keep much of the policy planning and deliberation as close as possible to those affected by the decisions. This would be a God-honoring way of demonstrating that human knowledge is local, dispersed, and fragmentary, and offering a more and of offering a more accessible invitation to take part in the public square. In short, globalization and capitalism are ways of organizing social and economic activity that have a certain structure and a certain direction. Political reductionism and too much centralization are ways of misdirecting the two. While there are complex political and social cultural issues to be sorted out, we must not ignore the essentially religious root of the crisis we face in public life. We put our trust in the political process, subsuming our entire pursuit of authenticity and community to the political realm and misuse that inflated political system through centralization and concentration of power. A hyper-politicized and hyper-centralized public square are then idolatrous distortions. We can only expect that they will lead those who are excluded from the process and its benefits to a feeling of despair or indifference, to say the least. The public square is an intertwinement of many spheres which are sovereign in their own domains. Each of them has a potential role to play in human flourishing. I have argued that the deeper level problems that we considered here result from distorting other spheres to the government sphere of public justice. When one sphere subsumes the others, we have a directional distortion of the public square. Direction is at the root a spiritual matter. We either use creational structures to honor God or we use them to express our hope in an idol. We put too much hope in politics. A flattening atomization of civil society is the result feared by Tocqueville and now denounced by thinkers such as Castell, Sennett, and Taylor. We realize perhaps at a very late stage that we run the risk of having to face the overwhelming power of the state by ourselves with no buffer in between. If in North America and in some European countries this flattening process is far from complete, it is only because of the persistence and perseveration of those who have made appropriate use of intermediary associations, which is precisely the direction in which Tocqueville, Kuiper, and Althusius would point. As Christians in the public square, what can we do now? When we discuss this topic as people of faith, we tend to forget how controversial it is to treat our presence in the public square as a manifestation of our religion. The prevailing modern liberal mindset discourages this idea, to say the least. At worst, it is flat out hostile to the notion of bringing faith to bear on issues of public policy, justice, and society. In America, a key claim raised against a distinctively Christian engagement with culture in general is that the U.S. Constitution speaks of a separation of church and state, and that is interpreted as a claim for the separation of religion and anything you argue or do in public. In Europe, secularists make a similar case for keeping religion out of the public square based on the anti-clerical principle. However, we cannot follow that path, though we may feel tempted to. So to encourage you, I would like to echo the 
words of Hans Rockmacher, a reformational thinker who did much to enhance our understanding of how Christians should engage with the culture. Quote, although there's no promise that Christianity will again be acknowledged as influential in our society, our task is not to shy away from our responsibilities. We are admonished to be humble, not to dream of doing God's work in our own strength. At the same time, we are commanded to be righteous, to do our task, to walk in God's ways. Rokemacher suggested the following formula as a guideline. Weep, pray, think, work. As we weep, pray, and think, about the current crisis in the public square. Let us remember that Christian individuals and organizations are not immune to the problems examined here. Poor expression in our political conversations, inappropriate personalization of our public lives, and lack of civility. We are not immune to the idolatry of reducing the potential richness of the public square to the monochromatic path of centralized policy and legal decision-making. And as we set out to work, let us keep in mind that we already count on a diversity of communities and intermediary associations that can do much to help us recover our public square. The church can improve the quality of our conversations in their preaching against false witness, for example, and their role of enforcing spiritual discipline. The university, the debate club, the model UN can foster a sense of public life and offer an environment where discussions and decisions are not necessarily a matter of superimposing our personal quest for authenticity on others. The extended family is an excellent arena to practice civility. We need not pursue the same closeness with distant relatives that we have with our siblings, but we must be polite. Civility. The business company provides some space for figuring out who we are, how exactly we're called to serve others with our work. And finally, the political committee campaigning against violence shows us that civil government has its God-given role of promoting order and public justice. Okay, so we have an opportunity to ask questions of the speaker. So if you would, just please wait until we get, give you the microphone uh, before you ask the question. But we've got about 15 minutes to do so. Uh, thank you very much. I enjoyed that presentation a great deal. <clears throat> I'm very tempted to ask you some questions about your new president, but I won't. You may. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have some Brazilians in the audience, actually, as well as people who have spent time there. So, But my question is, is much more esoteric. Um, I didn't hear two words in your remarks, and I'd be interested to know how it plays into your thinking about the church's role in the public square. Uh, and those two words are natural law. What would you say would be a way of incorporating natural law philosophy into your account of how the church should act in this public square, which you've described, I think, very rightly, is deeply confused right now? Well, I start with Althusius, and he, he makes a case from natural law that there is um, the need for associating and forming uh, groups of uh, people with, a, with the mission of developing certain areas of life. Uh, then I draw on Kuiper and others who don't really have a lot to say about natural law. So I appreciate the, the question. I think it's a very good question. Um, I'm, I'm not very comfortable with the way natural law has been used in some conversations. Um, uh, if you look at certain things that happen in nature, they're not necessarily what we want to happen in human society. Uh, some people draw on 
um, sexuality of animals to make the case for um, uh, new models of family. Um, so there has to be a cautious use of, of natural law in, in the conversation. But the other side of this is that um, I think a case could be made for those fears, sovereign fears, to be um, um, articulated theoretically, conceptually, as a, as a natural law issue. So if, God, if that's the way God created the world, with those fears, um, then, yeah, there's, there's space in the reformational tradition to try to, to seek, uh, there would be a space for that, to try to seek a natural law-based uh, articulation of the spheres of sovereignty argument. Uh, but there is a, a tension, uh, of course, uh, between the reformational tradition and, and scholasticism and the, the, the use that's made of natural law there. So it's not a very easy uh, mission to articulate these things, but uh, there is certainly a task there for natural law theologians to, to look into. Thanks for the question. Uh, thank you very much for your, for your talk. Uh, it's very, very illuminating, I, I think. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> so um, the, the part of it that uh, was most difficult for me to follow was the section on incivility. And uh, I would appreciate some clarification. It, I, I think I was misunderstanding in places because it seemed to me that in some of the examples that you gave, you were implying that for groups that have been subject to uh, public persecution or suppression to demand that the government validate their existence or for groups that have been subject to um, um, mistreatment in certain settings to, dis to demand that there should be safe spaces for them somehow constitutes incivility on their part. But I, I think I was missing something. I, I don't understand the connection between incivility and, and the examples that you were giving. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so to, uh, I, I make use of how Senate defines civility, and he defines that as a, a sort of uh, bridge between people who, don't, who are not very intimate and they can still do things together and have a conversation. Uh, so he defines civility as a kind of mask. Um, in a way, you're not really trying to bring your intimate self, your uh, everything you are to the public and to uh, do what, um, what you see a lot of these days on Facebook as people really showing who they are and pouring all the you know, their most inner thoughts for everybody to, to be exposed there, and, and everybody's supposed to accept that. Um, so he, he's basically trying to argue that there is a legitimate role for a healthy distance from people that allows you to do more things together rather than to feel threatened every time there is some kind of problem when you expose yourself like that. So it's, it's, it's a different kind of... Um, um, phenomenon that he's pointing at. But your question made me think of the uh, what reformers and, and later on other, um, well, the confessions of faith uh, say about office. So f for Senate, you, you, uh, we wear masks. Um, I think it's Richard Mao who has a book where he says that we wear different hats depending on which sphere we are acting in. Um, but I also think of the reformers and, and, uh, and the reform confessions when they say we, we bear offices and, and we need to figure out what the appropriate role for that specific office is. And a person engaging in, in a public conversation is exercising a certain kind of office as well. Uh, but we seem to have lost an understanding of that. Uh, Basically because, and I think that's Senate's argument, because nowadays uh, there's a belief that there's more legitimacy in being intimate and being close than in being in the public square. And so we, okay, if this is good, family life is good, being friends is good, so let's, let's make that the, the standard for our public engagement. And then we get confused 
when it doesn't work. I saw a lot of that in the Brazilian elections and the conversations people were having or not really having. Um, so that made me write that bit about civility. Brazilian friend, I make the question for you, Guy. Thank you. Um, pushing back the question of natural law raised before, right. what will be the relationship of uh, a Christian view of ethics? Just uh, thinking about Alistair McIntyre after Virtue book, any discussion in the public square, and how this re would relate with reformational view of ethics too and its relation with the public domains and so on. Right. Well, I think, thanks for the question. I think uh, that question has a lot to do with actually Charles Taylor's argument that, you know, it is okay to try to be true to yourself as, a, as an ethical standard. Uh, just the way it's being done today is not really helpful. And, and for him, if you do that consistently, you realize that you cannot do that using your own preference as the maximum standard for for measuring your own quest for legitimacy, authenticity, and so on. So you have to be embedded in a tradition. Uh, but I'm a more practical person when it comes to Christian behavior and so on. And I think the local churches have to rescue the role of, of, of being uh, places where uh, there is preaching happening, that, that is uh, gospel-based uh, preaching, but also places where Families will get visits regularly from the, the leadership that will help them figure out the, the hard issues of, of daily life and where there will be discipline. Uh, and I think more than the government fining people for saying the wrong things and so on, that I think the churches, at least within Christian communities, have to rescue the role of, of sanctioning inappropriate behavior and so on. Right. You could think about the, the, the role of the church in enforcing the Ninth Commandment in an age of fake news. That would be the wonderful topic for a symposium. <laughs> <laughs> so. Thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it. I, I think I learned so much from your talk. It's very thought-provoking. I have one comment and two questions. Um, I found that uh, the p there's a puzzle piece that's probably missing in your um, reasoning or laying out the the surface root the surface causes and the root causes uh, which is actually somebody brought up from a previous conversation the role of higher education or education um, um, because uh, we've well it's not a new theme because um, early in the 80s, Alan Bloom's uh, the, the closing of the American mind and George Marston's the soul of the uh, university uh, so I just wonder that uh, is are you considering that puzzle piece into your argument? And, and then two questions. One is that um, what is what is your assessment or evaluation of the current state of affairs within Christian circles? Like, if we suppose this church as a social sphere and it has probably has its own public subculture in it, do you see under undercurrents that are making up for these? crises or what's your assessment of it? Uh, sorry, can I ask you to repeat the, the last part of the question? Oh, uh, about the so church. if we take the church as a, a sphere and um, if we could think of it as having its own subculture as a sub public life within the circle of Christians, uh, either here or as you see um, uh, locally, um, what would be your assessment of the uh, current state of affairs or the developments within this circle? Right. Um, and the last question is, um, it, it, if you're advocating a reformational view um, as a remedy or possible solution, how to guard against the potential uh, anachronism, anachronism? Thanks very much. Uh, I'm just writing down the... Um, thanks for your question. I think it's really important that you make me uh, think about education. If I were to expand this talk into a booklet or something, I would definitely include the chapter on the role of education. Um, so I think of truth, beauty, and goodness. Uh, those are three principles that a classical education is supposed to 
uh, to train people in so that uh, when they articulate a conversation on Facebook or a live conversation, they will be truthful. They will do that with grace, with style, and they will be charitable to the, uh, to the other person. And I think education, whatever it is, will fail if it doesn't produce people who talk like that, who uh, engage like that. So um, that's what I have to say so far about education. But, uh, but I do think that when, when, um, when higher education is about implementing public, implementing public policy, and, and not so much about education as such, then we have a sphere sovereignty distortion there. So that much I have to say. About the church, I saw a lot of viciousness in how f fellow Christians were treating one another uh, during this uh, campaign in Brazil, the election campaign. And if, you're, if you don't support this guy, then you must be a communist. And if you don't support the other guy, then you're not a Christian and so on. So, you know, and now, I mean, I thought that being a Christian was about believing in Jesus for your salvation, right? And now it's, it's about voting for the right person. So uh, the, the, the church then was sort of asleep in this, in this process. The leadership, they were just caught by surprise that so many people all of a sudden had a lot to say about politics, right? So, and education comes in here because uh, many people have a lot to say about many things, yet the bookshops are all closing, right? So <laughs> they're going broke, so. Yet, full of opinions. Um, now, on the reformational thing, well, this is the, the lens that I wear to look at things. Um, it's not so much a solution, per se. It's just the way I interpret it. Uh, I think the solution is spiritual. So we just have to ask the question all the time, who? is in charge here, who is sovereign here? Is it politics, is it the state, or is it God? And if it's God, then we have a spiritual issue. It's not necessarily a reformation of philosophy, Kuiper, Doivret issue, but it's, a, it's an issue of you know, who is sovereign here. So, but, but thank you for your question, all right. Okay, please help me thank our Callahan Award winner. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you like to hear more of. If you're familiar with our past content or have attended an Acton event and would like to see it in a future episode, you can email us at producer at Until next week, for Acton Vault, I'm Gabriel Zsa. Zsa.